Let's do it. Another edition here of Goss on the Go. Everything you want to know about the sports world. We make it nice and easy for you in 30 minutes so you know everything you need to know. Before we get into it, we want to tell you about our partners. A big day coming up for Godzilla Media. We'll be broadcasting live from Hooters on Wolf Road in the Capital Region from 5 to 7. I say we, Levac and I, a day after his birthday, my pal Levac, what type of mood will he be in? Will he be hungover? Will he be looking to drink and eat? Celebrate Levac's birthday with me the day after his birthday. Thanks to Techies Fire and Water Restoration, your best way back to normal, tefirewater.com. Because of Mike Cord and his team, we're a part of the Albany Empire. We've got some Albany Empire surprises for you coming up on Friday. The NAL Championship Trophy. You're looking to take pictures. Maybe give it like Bill Raffer used to say, I love a kiss. You might be able to do that at Hooters. The trophy's set to be there. Am I allowed to talk about the surprises as well? I don't know. Usually LeVac blows the surprise, but I'm not going to. I'm going to give it a birthday gift. Other cool things ready to go. And don't forget, Hooters on Wolf Road is your home this NFL season for all the NFL action. Sundays, you're looking for a spot to go with you and your friends. Hooters, the perfect setup, the TVs, the beer, the service, and more. Hooters on Wolf Road. They continue to be the cure for the common restaurant. Check us out Friday, 5 to 7, live from Hooters. Oh, and by the way, we're going to be hanging around after the Godzilla Media Fantasy Football League draft. If you want to talk smack, I'll say and keep it clean for this podcast and find out who we're selecting and why, hang out. A lot of Godzilla Media podcast hosts will be there in attendance as well. Looking forward to that night. He may not be an actual member of Godzilla Media, but he definitely is a partner. And it's our guy Tom representing John Stone Supply in Troy. Tom has decided to put it on his back and say, I'm going to be the proud sponsor, the pride of John Stone in this year's Godzilla Media Fantasy Football League. We appreciate him. Also, we talked fantasy, a proud sponsor, that and other Godzilla Media podcasts as well. Don't forget, go out and support John Stone Supply. Make sure with the fall just around the corner that your house is ready to go for it. Right there on 6th Avenue in Troy. If you have a question about some of the products that they offer, give them a call today. 518-272-5922. 518-272-5922. Or visit their website, johnstonesupply.com. I've been in there before. I've got to meet the great staff. Tom, my guy, George, James, Kevin, Rob up front. These guys are going to be wonderful in helping you try to find out exactly what you need. Now, some of you might not know. Fujitsu ductless splits. Do you know what those are? How about energy saving ultra low temperature models that can keep your house negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit if you need it. Also the J series VRF systems for even more efficiency and flexibility, or maybe it's the Westinghouse made by Fujitsu for that more basic cost efficient option. Stop at a Johnston supply in Troy. Ask about these products. Find out how it can make your home safer for this upcoming fall, winter, and more. Your place Johnstone Supply in Troy. Stop in today, this season. Summer's almost over. Stop in this fall and find out what they can offer you. Proud sponsors of Godzilla Media Podcast and our friends over at Mohawk Honda. Selection is king as the weeks continue to just dwindle away here for the summer. Don't worry. It's worth the drive to Glenville to find out about the products that they can offer you. You're looking to trade in your vehicle. You're looking at the price that you deserve back. The place where you can do it is Mohawk Honda. Shout out to my guy, Greg Johnson. Him and his entire crew do a great job. The Herodin family and more. They want to make sure that you, wherever you're listening across upstate New York, that you have the ride you're looking for. Fits your lifestyle, your budget. I know it from my pilot. You've heard it a bunch this week as I look out to the driveway. Still not there. The wife's enjoying it across upstate New York. Now, whether you're sharing it with somebody in your life or you're using it for yourself, the pilot and all the great rides in Mohawk on are looking to help you stop worrying about other things you don't need to worry about your car anymore. Now Mohawk Honda can help you. Trade in your vehicle or find the vehicle you're looking for. It all happens right there on Freeman's Bridge Road, Mohawk Honda, where they always go out of their way to please you. Now, on to this week's episode of Guys on the Go. For the second week in a row, we're talking about the New York Yankees to lead off the podcast. The Yankees haven't lost since we last recorded. New York, 10-0 and in their last 10. Or maybe an easier way to put it, how about an 11-game winning streak? The Bronx Bombers now have some lead. In the American League wildcard chase, they've got a few games up on Boston and Oakland and Seattle. I've already told you what it's been. The bats, Rizzo and Stan and others smashing home runs. You can go across the plate. And I'm talking about guys who can hit for average, who can hit home runs. Yes, it's still a circus and entertaining when it comes to some of these final outs and games. 
But the New York Yankees made the moves at the deadline, and we can go through past Yankee rosters. Boy, you want to start talking about talent for the New York Yankees. This team seems to be poised for a deep postseason run because of what they did at the deadline. Now we'll wait and see if it happens. I'm sure that statement I just said has been said by me a few times in the Capital Region involving past Yankee teams that they just haven't been able to get back to the World Series since 2009 where they won it with CC and all their great additions. Yankee fans, I'm not trying to take anything away from you. But I could do another three and a half minutes on how good the Yankees are. I could do basically the same podcast talk I've done with the Yankees the last two to three weeks because you, you get it already. Isn't it more interesting what's happening with the Orioles and the Cat? Right? The New York Yankees have got on this historic winning streak when you talk about the history of this franchise. And the Orioles have gone the complete opposite way. I'm more fascinated by that, really. Like, let me know on social media or email. G-O-Z at GonzaloMedia.com. Tom Goz, T-O-M-G-O-Z-Z. My pal Jack Lampson loves that. When I always shout out to Twitter to myself. What's harder? What is actually more impressive? What the Yankees have done, winning 11 in a row, or what the Orioles are poised to do, lose 20 in a row? That's what's more interesting in this whole division, that we're seeing something we've almost never seen in the history of baseball. Look, I could be depressed and moan and groan about how bad my Orioles are. When you're that bad, it's sadly, it's like left embarrassing. It's funny at this point. Like, you're upset your team stinks. Then you're embarrassed. Then you don't want to talk about it. And then it gets to such comedic levels of failure that all you can do to get by the baseball season is laugh. It's that bad. The Yankees are good. Red Sox preseason were not better than the Yankees. And now as we get closer to September, starting to show. Again, those additions by Brian Cashman. Credit to all those guys. But I'm more fascinated by the Orioles. And if that cat, when the O's and Yanks played earlier this summer, is going to become a legendary figure in the history of this season. We had the Savages in the box. We've had the Billy Goat. We've had Babe Ruth. We've talked about curses. Why is the cat not getting more hype? The cat that changed the season. Yankee fans, enjoy it. Royal fans, get there early on Friday and drink a lot of beer with me. J-E-T-S. Uh, uh. Jets fans, what has happened this past week for you guys? First, the big news involving Carl Lawson. Supposed to be an impact player for the Jets on the defensive side of the football as my guy Rigney said from the Trav and Rigney show, Carl Lawson's dead. No, but he is out for the season. And now Carl Lawson heads to the IR. And then the news involving Vinnie Curry, former member of the 2017 Philadelphia Eagles championship team. Blood issue. He's out for the season. Now the New York Jets, even though Zach Wilson has looked fantastic in the preseason, even though the running back, Michael Carter, could be a more of an impact player than you realize. Corey Davis, statistically, is one of the best college football wide receivers of all time. Le'Veon Bell's no longer there. A new head coach. No more Adam Gase. You got to still tackle people. You still got to make plays on defense. And Jets fans, I have some optimism for you. As bad as it sounds with Lawson and Curry, both done. And they are both done for this season. I held out hope a little bit there for Lawson. That's not going to happen. Can't you make a trade? Chandler Jones, one of the most underappreciated players in the entire NFL, has asked the Arizona Cardinals to be traded. Chandler Jones feels like the J.J. Watt move may interfere with his career. He feels like the Cardinals have not appreciated him as, as much. And honestly, when you think about it, they really haven't. The stats Chandler Jones has put up, we're talking 72 and a half sacks over the past five seasons. 19 sacks in 2019 alone. And six of his nine seasons in the NFL, double-digit sacks. And don't forget about the stat involving sacks that you might have hurries, you might have pressures, you might have somebody who actually gets the sack over you even though you're in the quarterback's face. Those are just not even adding in any of those things to it. Jet fan wants Chandler Jones, and rightfully so. Get a pass rusher and look at the quarterbacks in the division now. You're either going to have a rookie in Mac Jones or a slower version of Cam Newton potentially behind center four. The New England Patriots, the Buffalo Bills, an active quarterback that can move in Josh Allen. Tua, what is he going to be in Miami in year two? There's the way you can do it, Jets fans. Make the move for Chandler Jones. Bring a New York guy back to New York. Have him be the impact player. Now, this is not a six-week injury. 
or a three-month injury. This is an entire season shifting moves for the New York Jets up front. Time of possession. If your D-line can't stop the run, Zach Wilson's not going to be on the field. Robert Sala can be the best coach that he wants. Eventually need those type of talented players. Make the move. Jet fan, the season is not over. Go get Chandler Jones. Now, here's the thing. With these rosters starting to shift a little bit, if Arizona wants to make room off the roster, salary cap-wise, they got to think about making this move in the next week to week and a half. So be patient, but it's possible, Jet fans. Can Joe Douglas land the biggest move of his GM career by bringing in Chandler Jones to his first-year head coach, Robert Sala? We wait and see. Jet fan, I'm rooting for you. Even though two impact players are down, Chandler Jones is the addition that you need. The battle between Jameis Winston and Taysom Hill, the Monday night stage was set for my former Tampa Bay Buccaneer quarterback, Jameis Winston, to win the starting job over Taysom Hill. And Jameis Winston looked awesome. Jameis Winston's deep ball was on point. The leadership of Jameis Winston, I know there's been a lot of jokes, and I've been one of them. I helped out our guys, Sports with a Z and a T, title their podcast, Eating W's. The legacy of Jameis Winston is a former number one pick, Heisman Trophy winner. Not working out in Tampa. He looked good in New Orleans. But as excited as I am for Winston, you know, I, I should sit right there because I think some people might feel differently about the way I feel about Jameis Winston. No matter if it's your favorite football team, baseball team, basketball team, if a player comes to your organization and is looked to be the one that changes the face of the organization, to make your team a loser to a winner, to change the ways in which what's happened for years and years, and he doesn't live up to the hype, there is some resentment. Some hatred from even more passionate sports fans that that athlete, whether it be the quarterback, the point guard, the center, there is you are the reason we're still losing. You're not good enough. And some fans aren't able to get over that. That's how they think about that athlete forever. I am not like that in any way with Jameis Winston. I get that he plays for the New Orleans Saints that is in the same division as the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I'll be rooting for Jameis Winston 15 times this season. Out of the 17 regular season games. Nice, I nailed that one. The only two times I won't root for him to play well is against my Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I want to see him have success. Because as a Buccaneer fan, I've already seen my team win the Super Bowl. The move was right. There is not even a doubt that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers organization made the right decision in dumping Jameis Winston, bringing in Tom Brady, one season, one championship. You're still going to hate on Jameis Winston? For what? Here's the reasons I'll take a little pause on the Winston locked in as a starter, though. And I've had this take on multiple podcasts. And if I'm wrong, you know where to find me. Is one game against the worst team in the NFL good enough to win a starting job for? He played against the Jacksonville Jaguars at home. Jacksonville, historically bad last season. If it wasn't for that one victory in week one, we could have seen a defeated team. Owen 16 have the number one overall pick and land Trevor Lawrence. So the worst team historically bad gets torched in the preseason. Oh, by the way, that Jaguar team has a college coach as their head coach who's never coached in the NFL before. So because Jameis Winston looked good against an awful team in the history of the NFL with a new coach, that locks up his starting job. So we're going to ignore everything that happened in the 2020 season when Winston was a part of the Saints. And then when push came to shove and they had to make a decision, the Saints and Sean Payton, that's a lot of S's, by the way, they decided on Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill, I get he's a gimmick and all this other stuff. He threw the ball in those games. He put up 200-plus passing yards. Just because we've seen him been used as that wildcat, big back, monster back, he can throw the football. So we're going to ignore how he performed in the 2020 regular season games. We're going to ignore that Sean Payton started Hill over Winston when he had the opportunity. But all we're now going to focus on is that Winston lit up the Jags. And that's a good enough reason to start him. I'm not even touching. No, no, I will now. The 30 interceptions that Jameis Winston threw? Just out the window. Hey, you threw less than 15 passes against the Jags. You're our guy. Okay. All right. Luckily, I'm almost done with these one-week, let's turn it down a notch rants about the NFL preseason. We're two weeks away from the NFL games actually kicking off, previewing the season, talking about picks and lines and more. I'm getting so sick of this preseason stuff. Taysom Hill, 
I'll ride that till it's over. My buddy Prez just kept Winston in a two quarterback keeper league. Kept one of his quarterbacks as Winston. We'll see if he's actually the starter. I don't believe it until Winston runs out of the field week one of the regular season. The big sports media news of the week is that Andrew Marshan and others are reporting that Rachel Nichols will no longer appear on ESPN television. Her show, which I guess it's not a secret anymore, was made for her when she came back to ESPN. The jump is canceled. It's done. ESPN's going to put in a new afternoon show, although I don't know why people aren't piecing this together. They're saying it's a new NBA afternoon show, but there's also a report out there that Max Kellerman's going to get his own show, so maybe, maybe it's not. Either way, ESPN has decided that the jump is over. Rachel Nichols' future at ESPN was in question post-Maria Taylor situation. Some have questioned whether or not Rachel Nichols is actually going to sue ESPN, and you wonder what her career is going to look like. Is she going to sign on with maybe LeBron James's company that put out Space Jam 2 and Maverick Carter because of the relationship that she's had professionally with them? Maybe she becomes one of the faces of that. Does she launch her own network? Does she go to somewhere? She's got powerful agents. The relationship, I believe it's her mother-in-law is Diane Sawyer. She could still have a career somewhere else if she wants. But what happened with her and Maria Taylor, the contract, Rachel Nichols was right. She signed a piece of paper that said, here's what's going to happen. And ESPN didn't honor her contract. It's as simple and easy as that. Uh, I feel for Rachel Nichols because, well, you know what? Just go back and listen to an old podcast. I'll just let that sit there. Uh, Yeah, so Rachel Nichols is done on ESPN. Clay Travis, for those who can and can't stand him, I know he's a very polarizing voice in the sports media world. He called it the woke, eating the woke. Look, sometimes Clay Travis is dancing around and saying, look at me, I want the clicks and the attention. Other times, you at least have to pause and think about what Clay Travis says on this topic. Because Rachel Nichols had been doing things politically that other broadcasters hadn't. Siding with the NBA players, making it a very public statement that she was with this side of the political agenda of certain athletes which at one point in broadcasting history would never have been allowed. But ESPN let her do it. And then ESPN found out the ways in which she thought of the network and that she had known that they hadn't done enough for black people, female employees, broadcasters. And she was recorded saying it in a private conversation. And then it was over. What do we take away? What do we learn from the Rachel Nichols, Maria Taylor situation? Get really powerful agents to leak things about people you don't want to work with anymore to end their careers? Some could argue that's what Maria Taylor's agents did to make Rachel Nichols the bad person in this. Some could argue that you always have to remember the microphone is on. Okay. Some would say this. Don't take political agendas if you're a broadcaster. Hashtag stick to sports. That there's an audience that just doesn't care about what you think politically. I've done my best on this podcast to stay away from that too. And I think I'm going to. Because there's so many other realms and avenues that if you want to get that stuff, go out and get it. Sports radio and sports talk in general. There's almost like this forced topic. I've said this a ton. I'll say it a ton in the future. I love the quote from Mike Greenberg that used to say this about podcasts more so than sports radio. That your job was to reflect interest and not generate interest. And that's my goal of this podcast. There's so many specific sports and teams and topics that each podcast that you can find can have that. So if you want to go out and seek what you want, you can do it. I get it. It's a restaurant. I get it. It's the menu you're going through in podcast land and it benefits the listener and the audience. And I love all those things, but I'm still going to do what I believe works well for sports fans. And that is reflect interest and stay away from the political stuff. Rachel Nichols decided she was going to dip her toes into it. And eventually she got bit. And it might be a warning for future broadcasters. If you're going to decide to do that, be prepared for what comes next. Teased it last week. 
the return of CM Punk. What was it going to mean for All Elite Wrestling Rampage the second night of that show debuting for that organization? How are the ratings going to come out? Was CM Punk actually going to be there? I've been a wrestling fan for 20 plus years. Some of you hear this part of the podcast. You skip right through it. That's okay. Try not to on this one. Just hear me out on this. One more time. We are entering a new golden age of professional wrestling. That CM Punk moment. Anybody from The Rock to Hulk Hogan to Stone Cold Steve Austin. Anybody in the history of my lifetime. So like 1989 to 2021. Find me. Somebody who ever got the ovation, the pop, like CM Punk just did in Chicago. 15,000 people going nuts. You want to tell me the Silver Dome and Detroit did that with Andre the Giant? If my math adds up, I think that's before 89. So, okay, that one probably would have not counted. So there you go. I'm good on that. The Hardy Boys at MetLife Stadium because there was 90,000 people there. These WrestleMania moment pops. Nothing. Quite like CM Punk coming back. A guy who had been gone for six and a half, seven years. Who had this cult following. And I say that as a compliment, not as somebody being creepy. Because it was these professional wrestling fans who felt like, I'm CM Punk. People don't believe in me. I do it my way. You're anti-authority. You're the reason why I watch. And chanted his name in the WWE to disrupt shows for plus five, six, seven minutes. Now, what happens next? Is that the peak? Is that the moment? Will it get any better than that moment right now? Like, Are you even honestly excited to watch CM Punk versus Darby Allin? I feel like I was far more excited about that moment than what's next. Because as fun as CM Punk is in the ring, and this has no disrespect to what he's done as a talent, a WWE champion for a year plus, and what he can actually do inside the squared circle. Maybe it's the sports talk guy in me or a talk professional in me. I'm far more fascinated by him with a microphone in his hand. The pipe bomb in Las Vegas when he was with the WWE leading to that summer of punk is why I became a punk fan. Honestly, before that, I thought he was okay. Like, some people like him, some people don't. I was, I was kind of indifferent about him. I care when he talks and how he talks and how he delivers a message and how he hypes up a match. That's the stuff that I find so intriguing about CM Punk that makes him so much different than anybody else in professional wrestling. And honestly, one of the most unique characters in the history of professional wrestling. You can go through the moments of Hulk Hogan leg dropping at Bash at the Beach. Or is it the Great American Bash? All the names get mixed up at this point. You know the moment the NWO starts. You can run through these times of people jumping from show to show. But that was truly the greatest ovation, the greatest pop, the greatest moment with one wrestler returning in my lifetime in the history of professional wrestling. That's where the bar is set. That first weekend in September, Punk versus Darby Allen, deliver. And if the crowd's into it, that might be good enough because the passion of the All Elite Wrestling fans is there. Take my money, Tony Khan. As great as the return of Sir CM Punk, SummerSlam, the day after AEW Rampage had stuff to live up to. They pack Reliance Stadium, which again looks like a something out of outer space. I'm going to go see something in that Vegas stadium, whether it's the Raiders play or some big concert or some big fight. Amazing to watch that actually come to life on television. So the WWE on SummerSlam, which you can say is the second biggest event for them on the calendar behind WrestleMania has not one but two of their stars return. The man, Becky Lynch, after being pregnant, and the beast incarnate, Brock Lesnar. So those two household names coming back to an event, and if you're a fan of the arena, you're fired up because you get to see one of your more familiar names, and you might be fans and everything else. But how do they botch both of those? Both. Both completely botched. And here's what I mean by that. Okay. So Becky Lynch comes back and defeats Bianca Belair, who is this young up and coming winner at WrestleMania. She wins the championship. She beats her in what, about 10 seconds? Why are you burying one of your young stars that fast? Now look, if Becky Lynch had rolled her up or Bianca Belair's taken out one of her earrings, the bell rings, Becky rolls her up and she beats her. You start a rivalry like that. That's pretty cool. Okay, I can get with that. If somehow, some way, the WWE had leaked it out or teased or did something along the lines of 
hey, Becky Lynch might be at SummerSlam. So you get that crowd reaction. She can go five to ten minutes. All right. Now, we might have more details about this because the originally scheduled match was Bianca Belair versus Sasha Banks. There's a chance we may or may never find out if Sasha Banks or Scarlett, who usually accompanies Karrion Cross. Now, I'm going to skip the NXT stuff because I feel like that was actually a mess, a lot of the stuff that happened in that match. But Sasha Banks might be COVID protocol for all I know. But why have Becky beat her in 10 seconds? I like Becky Lynch. Is she going to be a heel? Do they think that that finish is going to actually get the fans behind Bianca Belair? I just didn't get it. I like that Becky Lynch came back. I think she's entertaining. We just talked about CM Punk. Becky Lynch is great on the microphone. She's got some good stuff. But either let her go 10 minutes or roll up finish. Didn't like that. And the thing with Brock Lesnar. Okay, Roman Reigns and John Cena have an entertaining match. It's back and forth. Those guys know how to do it. The crowd was into it. I'm into it watching it. It's a late, I want to call it a late tip off. A late start to that match. And it was good. Who knows the next time we'll see John Cena, maybe for a monster match. Who knows? Maybe his final match will be Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. And he'll call on a career or a young up-and-coming star he'll lose to, and that'll be his match. But why in the hell do I want to see Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar again? I've seen it year after year at WrestleMania. It doesn't have to happen again. Who is excited to see Reigns versus Lesnar? It got booed out of the building a few years ago at WrestleMania. Now, that actually was a good match, unfortunately. The fans just hated it so much that they booed it out of the building. But it was a good match. But I don't want to see it. When Brock Lesnar first came back, when Brock Lesnar, the day after WrestleMania, that was my senior year in college. That was the spring of 2012. Nine years ago. We did the Lesnar came back. Oh my God, this is nine years ago. That means if you're nine years old, you're 18 now. You still think Lesnar coming back and surprising people is cool? This is what the WWE did for about a decade plus with The Undertaker. When you keep going back to the well, eventually you're either going to expect or not think this is good anymore. Move on from Lesnar. Have somebody else come back. I don't get why the WWE can't make the one move. Could you imagine if the WWE stole somebody from AEW? Wasn't that the fun part about the Monday Night Wars? The WCW kept stealing people from the WWE. And at some point there was a switch. And you had people like the Radicals coming over and Chris Jericho coming over. Why can't the WWE steal somebody away from AEW? Imagine the star that they would be. Unless those wrestlers are so passionate they don't want to leave Tony Khan. I just didn't get it. I thought SummerSlam overall was okay. But I just wasn't a fan of those big returns. I feel like I hyped this up every week. The return of college football stuff. All right. I'll give you a little preview of the college football stuff that's coming up. Week zero, which I'm becoming a fan of. I'm into the week zero stuff. Someone had to explain it to me. I think it was actually LeVac. Happy birthday, LeVac, by the way. If you're listening to this podcast, you might be listening on Thursday. Happy birthday. The big four five. It's my pal. Jeffrey Allen Levac Sr. Come celebrate one more time. A nice plug for Hooters here. One more time. Come celebrate Levac's birthday the day after at Hooters. Here's a little peek into the college football preview you got coming next week. We're going to talk conference champions. We're going to talk about some wagers you might want to think about. Some over-unders that I really like. A little bit more heavy gambling segment next week, but that's okay. Some of you might be coming all year long for those picks. I want to quickly talk about Syracuse football. Syracuse football is going to open up their season on the road against Ohio September, that first Saturday. Reports coming from Central New York that Dino Babers might let both quarterbacks play. Tommy DeVito versus Garrett Trader, the transfer from Mississippi State. Both have looked good in training camp. And for those who don't follow the Syracuse football program, why this is intriguing, Tommy DeVito was the most hyped quarterback prospect since Donovan McNabb. Tommy DeVito at the Elite 11 camp beat out Jake Fromm and Tua for the MVP, and he's tapped his commitment to Syracuse. People who were Orange fans thought this kid's gone. And he showed up. He's had concerns with the offensive line. He's been injured. It just never has lived up. Eric Dungy, who just recently got cut by the Bengals, is the reason why Syracuse had that double-digit win season just a few years ago. Now Schrader comes in from the SEC. Still really an unknown when you think about it. But Syracuse fan just wants something different. And the reports are both are going to play. What are my thoughts on a two-quarterback system? Somebody's eventually going to make it work, right? 
I feel like I've heard about the two quarterback system for 20 years and it's never worked because you wanted a run guy and a pass guy. And if you know as a fan who's your run guy and who's your pass guy, so does the defense. Oh, this quarterback's in, they're going to run. Oh, this quarterback's in, they're going to pass. Good enough teams can stop it. I wish that Syracuse would be able to just have DeVito step back and sling it like it's seven on seven and Schrader run the offense like a power option. And that's where Syracuse football has had this weird identity crisis of do they want a madman like Dungey karate kicking people like Miami? Or do they want a guy like a, a, the late Colt Brennan who just steps back and fires it in there like they did at Hawaii? Do you know Babers has coached in Hawaii before? I just want Syracuse to win. And if it involves two quarterbacks going out there and playing and they're getting reps and that's how it's going to work and it's not a recruiting thing, if you told me that Schrader or DeVito were freshmen and that's why they're doing it because they don't want the kid to transfer, I think that would be pretty lame. But that's not the case here. Two players that have real opportunities to have impact plays for the Syracuse Orange. That's my take on that. I'm fine with the two quarterback system if they beat Ohio. And Ohio's really good. Here's a preview. Ohio's going to win the MAC this season. Syracuse is an underdog against Ohio. If two quarterbacks works, let's find out. Toss them out there. Just like the kickoff classic when it was Penn State versus Syracuse. And Allen was the quarterback and people want Terrell Hunt. Terrell Hunt was later in and he helped out the team much more than Allen did. Let's find out. Let's rip off the band-aid. You had camp and you had game one and make the decision after that. Either you're going two QBs for the rest of the year or one guy significantly better than the other. All right, that's this week's Guys on the Go. Next week, college football week zero. Let's go. And a lot more on the way. Till next time, hope to see you Friday at Hooters.